happened was basically, as we all know, the bottom fell off of the world in 2008 and it had fallen off for me personally as well. And, um, I was a homeless alcoholic and I got sober in 2008 and someone in a meeting taught me in a sobriety meeting, taught me how to knit when I had like 60 days sober. And within a month I was like knitting and dying. And then within three months I was spinning. And then within six months I was dying, spinning, carding, knitting, and teaching it. So October, 2008 will be my 16th year, um, teaching in sit or I'm sorry, October of this year will be 16 years that I've been teaching and um, dying and doing all of this. And I remember back then, like Etsy was new. <clears throat> um, there were no tutorials on YouTube whatsoever about dying, unless we're talking about Easter egg pellets or Kool-Aid, but nobody, I had, there was nothing that said where to get the raw base fiber, where to get the raw yarn, where to get the dyes, what kind of dyes, you know, to find Dharma trading with their very, very um, information light tutorials and the way it took me thousands of hours of research and development to be able to create exactly what I envisioned in my head. And I don't think anybody should have to spend thousands of hours to have a concept and execute the concept. So the main thrust of any workshop I teach, the books I've been working on since 2017, um, is to reverse engineer. So you have, let's say you have a project you want to work for. What do you want it to ombre? Do you want it to speckle? Do you want it to marl? Do you want to tweed? What kind of color pattern do we want? All semi-solid tonals, et cetera. So that, because I think we've all, had a beautiful braid or a beautiful bat or a beautiful skein of yarn that was handmade. And no matter what you made out of it, it was never as pretty as it was in its raw form, right? And then maybe it looked good in the bat and it looks good in the yarn, but terrible in the project. And that can really discourage a lot of people who are otherwise absolutely in love with textile arts, but you can only spend $350 on a project that is absolutely hideous and you will never wear it. And you spent 60 hours spinning and knitting it before you just don't trust yourself or maybe even the people selling the fiber that you're going to love it all the way through the process. That was the hardest part for me. And so the reason why I just, you know, I go down this hyper fixation hole of how do you take apart your vision, your creative and what you want to make and break it down into its individual parts so that each step of the way you're doing your um, fiber cleaning, your fiber dyeing, your fiber carding, your spin application style, all the way up to the knit. So that every step of the process, there's that magic infection we all get as fiber artists when it's just working up so good, you can't put it down. You can't stop spinning it. You can't stop knitting it because it's working up the way you wanted to or better. And I'm trying to basically capture lightning in a bottle, meaning um, that experience we've all had that hooked us into fiber arts that we can reliably repeat that and really grow on our skills while leapfrogging the crappy parts of learning how to do all of this. So obviously um, I would not be able to drag my laptop down into the dye lab and then make you guys sit and watch me set up and die. We'd be here for three hours and a lot of dead time. So I've had these pre-filmed um, so that you can see exactly what we're going to be doing, just like a cooking show where they're like, add the onions, do the thing. And then they pull the finished one out when, you know, that's what we're going to be watching. And so we have a couple of videos we're going to go through. And then in, at the end, we're like 30 minutes of um, or less of videos. And then we're going to have a Q&A. Any questions you have, drop them in the chat or write them down. And I will be available to all of you for as long as it takes. I booked the whole day off. Not that I think the textile center has all day, but I do. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. No, I so think you're okay. first thing. Yes, yes, we have. Beautiful bats and well-prepared fleece is actually selecting the fleece. So I want to show you the difference between these beautiful curls I got from Labor of Love Farm. And you can see they're not felted and there's no cotting at where they the cut end of this is. This is another fleece that was sold for the same amount from a different supplier that I will not name. But you can see there's a lot of sticks and dirt and it's completely felted at the base. 
So, and you see that there's really not that much lock definition. It's very ratty and frizzy. So the key to a beautiful bat is starting with a beautiful fleece. Um, I only buy coated fleeces and I buy them from prize winning farms and they're not cheap. I think for, I don't know, a couple, two, three pounds, you could spend a hundred to $150, but the animals are beautifully maintained. They wear coats, the fleece is well kept. And I don't have to worry about chunks of poop and straw and hay when I go to card this. So I'm going to have these with me at stitches. And this is what we're gonna learn how to prepare today are these lovely little packs of fleece and silk and silk noil and sparkle. And a great fleece, like this particular one, you see even after cleaning and dyeing, it drafts apart beautifully and there's no hay or dirt or chunks in it. So let's get started. You're gonna wanna get some really big pots. I do everything on induction, so my pots are stainless steel. And that just means that they corrode less and rust less and they're conductive on the burner. I'm going to use some Arm & Hammer other people use unicorn power scour. There's all kinds of wool scour stuff. I just find this is cheap and easily available. So we're going to fill this to the top with a cup of Arm & Hammer. So we're ready to put our fleece in our mesh bags. These are just laundry bags for um, bras that I got at the grocery store. It's important that you only put about half to three quarters of a pound in here. You don't want to pack it tight because if you pack it tight, the water's not going to flow through and the fleece on the middle, in the middle will be greasy and then it won't take the dye. So this gorgeous fleece just peels right apart and I'm going to fill it about like this so that the water will flow through. I'm going to do the other fleece side by side so you guys can see the difference in processing a really high grade fleece and what I would call more of a second cuts fleece, although it was sold to me as a first cut. As you can see, this is really cotted at the tips and it's kind of demi felted. So we're going to put this in here like this. Yeah. You can see it said it was coated, but it's caked in dirt right here. I'm not going to be able to get this out with washing. I'm going to have to flick the tips, which means I won't have the beautiful curly lock anymore because I will have to rat it open to get the dirt out. So also this fleece, if you had smell-o-vision, smells very strong compared to the other one. A little bit more. All right. Now what I'm going to do is take my tongs. I brought this up to a boil. Now we're going to back the temperature off to 200. Put this right in here. We want the water as close to boiling as possible without boiling. And then I'm just going to gently submerge it. You want to come show? Now, if you look at this fleece, the water is not that dirty, right? It's almost clear. And this is the first pass. Now, if we look at this fleece, and if I roll this through, you can see that there's quite a bit more dirt in this fleece that's coming out. So we're gonna leave these at 200 degrees for 20 minutes, and then we're gonna come back and do a rinse. I've prepared some 50 gram mulberry silk nests that we're gonna dye for the art bat. But I wanted to show you why I like using mulberry silk versus tussa. So you can take a silkworm that's eaten whatever it wants to in the wild and the resulting silk is called tussa. And as you can see, it's like a honey brown color. And when you dye this, you know, you're not going to get fluorescent neon colors out of it because the base color is brown. There's also, where did I put it? Something called bleached tussa. And I'm going to show you the difference. Bleached and wild next to each other. So while it is lighter, much like bleached hair, 
this is kind of, it's not as lustrous as the mulberry silk. Mulberry silk is silkworms that are specifically and only fed the leaves of the mulberry tree, and therefore the resulting silk is bleach white naturally, very lustrous, and it will take the color super vividly. So that's why today we're going to be dyeing some of these little silk nests along with some silk noil for our bat. Now we're going to also portion out some silk noil. What is silk noil? Well, it is basically a waste product as far as I've been told that's created when reeling silk um, roving or sliver, which I just showed you. So what I like to use silk noil for is texture in a bat. And it's how I create tweed. I don't like using, you know, short staple wool. I feel like it doesn't stick as well in the yarn. And I just love how beautifully it takes the color. So this is raw silk noil. And I have my little tower of all different colors of silk. And I want to show you the difference between Tussa noil and mulberry noil, same dye batch. Do you see how rich and vivid this color is and how dusty and dark this color is? That's the difference between over dyeing a natural brown fiber and a bleach white fiber. So I will dye 10 pounds of noil, 50 different colors, and then I just have them in these little, you know, um, color coded jars. And I also wanted to show you guys another fiber I really like. It's called Soft Silk, S-O-F-F-S-I-L-K. And it's like a combo between silk noil and um, regular silk. It's not as short staple as silk noil, but it's just, it's so lovely. It doesn't create quite a tweed, but it gives a beautiful halo to the finished yarn. So I'm gonna show you another thing right here. Recycled carded sari silk. I buy this and it's all different colors of shredded up saris from India usually. And I love using these in combination with silk noil because as you can see, there's all these different textures and tones within this carded sari roving. I usually get it from Mary at Kamaj, C-A-M-A-J fiber. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to gently pull this up and put it in a strainer and let the water drain off. And then I'm going to dump this out, not on top of it, but on the side, because we don't want to agitate this fleece at all. And then basically, I'm going to fill this up, bring it back to boil, and I'm going to do a rinse. And then I'm going to have some more hot water, and I'm going to go do another wash and another rinse. And usually two washes, two rinses, and your fiber is perfectly beautiful, white, and ready to go. And then we're going to go straight into dyeing it. Now we're going to wet out our silk. Silk is hydrophobic. That means it repels water. If I were to try and just wet it, it doesn't take the water. And if you just put this in water, it'll float on the top even if you leave it for 24 hours. So I like to use something called Synthropol. It's just a textile detergent and I use it as a wetting agent and it's pH neutral so it won't mess up the dye strike. So I'll do mm, probably about a teaspoon and some warm water and then we put our silk nests in for about 12 hours. And if you do less than that, what will happen is when you go to dye the silk, only the exterior of the silk will be dyed. And when you draft it apart, it will be bone white inside. And we don't want that. We want thorough, even saturation. So this step, putting a nice surfactant like Synthropol in is great. I would not recommend Dawn or any of these dish soaps. I highly recommend you just go with Synthropol and that's S-Y-N-T-H-R-A-P-O-L. You can find it from ProChem, you can find it from Dharma, you can usually even get it on Amazon. But um, this step is the difference between having solid shade and white patches. So now we're gonna talk about nylon. There are multiple types of nylon. Um, the two that I use, this one's trade name is Snow Mountain Nylon. And I wanted to show you 
This is the same, these were in the same pot. Do you see how differently the dye takes on the silk versus the nylon? Um, so there are typically three types of nylon and I classify them by luminosity. I don't have an example of the second type because it's no longer milled. But this is trilobal nylon and it is very sparkly and its trade name with Louette, I believe, is Icicle, but it's mostly known as Firestar. And um, you can add a little bit of this and it will give you a beautiful glimmer to your project with also, also the strength of the nylon. But if you're not into sparkly, they also make a kind known as Snow Mountain and it's got a much lower luminosity level, so it's not as bright and glittery. But this will add strength to your project and it'll also really take the dye beautifully so you get different tones just based on how the fibers are taking the dye. So I typically will not go over 10% nylon and that's just because the bat starts to feel plasticky and like acrylic because as pretty as the nylons are, they're dead. There's no balance, there's no stretch to this and the fiber itself feels very uh, fake in your hands. So I use this to augment the look of my bats and add some strength, but I don't go overboard with it because I want them to still feel like natural, beautiful fibers. So I have these top pieces. And what I'm gonna do, I'm basically gonna fold them in half like this, throw them in a tray, wet them out, and this will take the fiber, the dye, I'm sorry, the water fairly easily. And I'll basically let this, I'll fill it up, let it sit, and then we're going to come back and we're going to rainbow paint this. And I'm going to strip it into small pieces and run it across the drum. And that's part of how I get a really rich, saturated, textured, beautiful um, appearance to the bat. So before you even strip it up to spin it, it's just opulent and glittery. So we'll get into that when this is done. Now we're ready to dye. So I'm going to give you like a very brief overview, but if you go on my YouTube, which is easy to find, youtube.com slash Nicole Frost Yarn, I have like a whole video on how to calculate dye percentages. But basically, I want 4% degree of strength. That means 4% the weight of, say, a 100 gram skein would be 4 grams. 3% would be 3 grams. In this case, we have... 50 grams of mulberry silk and 10 grams of noil for 60 total grams times 4% is 2.4 grams of dye. And this little handy dandy thing I made, so this would be, you know, 4 and 5% black. And over here, fractions of a percent is gray. So it's just the weight of the dye in proportion to the weight of the fiber. 4% is a very deep depth of shade. 1% is generally pretty pale. 2% would be closer to your mid-shade, 3 and 4%, depending on the strength of the dye. Some dyes are milled to be very dark, some dyes are milled to be very light, and I'm going to give you an example of that right now. This is a dye card that ProChem makes, and as you can see on this side, a lot of these colors are really pale, and they're at 1.5% weight of goods. And, you know, you've got this beautiful burgundy, and that's also 1.5%. So each color has its own strength profile and I wish they told you up front they don't you just kind of have to figure it out so anyway we're going to be doing very saturated I'm going to take you downstairs and show you how I measure that out we're going to take a little bit of citric acid and put it in our dye jar and we're going to take 2.4 grams and I use a gram scale that goes to fractions of a gram and this is rhodamine red from ProChem it's a super, super bright hot pink. Oh, look at that, 2.4 on the nose. And in here. Now I'm gonna fill this up to the top, hottest tap water I can get. Here's our little nest of silk and some silk noil. And I put it in a clear bucket. And the reason I do this is because, here's our beautiful color, I need to massage this dye in so I don't have those white marks. You need to turn it over and really massage. And then I pour a little bit more and I massage a little bit more because see it only dyes the outside not the inside if you don't work it in so I'm gonna do that with all the rest of the colors and I will come back when it's time to heat set them and I'll show you how I heat set 
batches of colors so I can get 30 to 40 colors in a single two hour session. Now we're gonna take all of this and transfer it into a wide mouth ball jar, about that big. And we pour the leftover dye stock over the top. I'm gonna finish with the last 10 colors. This is how I store all of my dye. We have this on our double burner, and this is a hot water bath from the tap, and I can fit 12 large um, uh, wide mouth ball jars, and we're just gonna put this on at maximum temperature for 45 minutes. Once these are cool, I will rinse them, and then we'll start on the fleece. Let's check in on our fleece. As we can see, there's still kind of yellowy, dirty tips on the crappy fleece. Look at this. No felting, just beautiful. Versus these that come up in clumps because they're all felted together before I even washed it. Now I'm gonna put all of these plus our Firestar in batch number two. Next morning, these have cooled completely. And as we can see, the dye has absorbed. So I will just show you clear water. Now we rinse this and throw it in the drain and spin cycle on the washer and put it out to dry. Gonna let this dry in the California sun. Grab up all this fiber and bag it. And that brings us to right now, ready to card. So the first thing I'm doing is running on the drum, some pre-painted super fine American Merino. I like to paint my fiber before I card it for the smoothest of transitions. Now we're running in Sari Silk, a little bit of Silk Noil, some Firestar, which is a high sparkle fiber, and Silk. My use Mulberry Silk because it's so pretty. Now we do another layer of wool. This is a double wide Strouch Mad Batter, so I can get about nine ounces on the drum, although I usually stick to five. Now I'm laying out some Firestar, and then we're gonna lay out some silk. And I like to open the tips so that it goes on nice and smooth, not in a giant clump. And then Firestar and more Silk Noil, more of the uh, Angelina, and then our final pass of wool. And then we're gonna put our layer on top. And the reason I like to make my bats multi-layered like this is because I find it makes a beautiful end result in the yarn. It really shows when you don't just put one pass of pretty stuff across the top, but all throughout the inside of the bat. The yarn is so fun to spin and so fun to knit with. And now we're just running the Angelina, more Silk Noil, more Sari Silk, more regular Silk. I'd say this bat is easily 25% Silk and Sparkle. And then I'm putting a tiny pass of orange across the top, and here's the result. I love the back because it shows how smooth the gradient is. And we pull it off and admire our handiwork. This bat took 15 minutes and two seconds to card. And that's why I rarely offer bats because they cost so much time to create and dye every element, but I think it's worth it. And our last one, and this is just the trailer for the specific class that was built. This particular class I'm gonna be um, teaching for the uh, textile center is something I've never offered before. And it's basically to create your own library of everything that I'm writing in the book. If you've ever wanted to know not only every carding technique, but create your own carding technique library from your own hand dyed and hand spun, this five day intensive at the Textile Center of Minneapolis is for you. And you get my printed compendium as a class material as well. And if you've ever wanted to know what a dye looks like before you've bought it, see swatches on yarn and receive your very own laminated color atlas for seven different dye lines, this class is for you. Confused by how gradients are created or the math behind the beautiful fades? Not anymore. We're gonna make our own 66 color triad study on brown, gray, and white roving for our own color book to take home. Learn how to translate dye percentages into milliliters and spend an entire day on one color saturation studies, two color gradients, and three color triads. Black dye, who makes the best? What's the undertone and saturation point at 10 different values so you can glaze, tone, or black wash with confidence? We're gonna take a dirty fleece, learn to clean it to preserve lock structure, dye it, and create our own color studies with it, as well as learn how to card bats from fleece. Different preparations and colors of silk 
like Tussa, Bleached Tussa, Mulberry, and Silk Noil versus Silk Top and how we use it to cart into bats. Did you know there are different preparations of nylon in different luminosities and we'll be dying and learning how each work up into a bat and what they're good for? We'll also be creating our own breed studies on eight different fiber types for you to go home and create your own spun samples with a beautiful reference book to mount the swatches. What are you waiting for? Click the link in the description to snag your spot today. And if you need to travel to get to class, you can be matched with other traveling students to cost share your lodging. Those are so, those videos are amazing, Nicole. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let me pause sharing. There we I go. Mean, we have some questions that have come in and I want to make sure we get to those. And I'm yes. sure there'll be more. I just want to stare at those colors all day. Mm -hmm. They're so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, I, I color is life. It definitely brings joy and vibrancy. I do not neutrals do not spark joy for me. <laughs> I just but I can show you how to dye them. Yes, and we did have a question just for clarification. I know we've talked about it, but there was a question that came in about carding, um, and is that something that you're also going to have time to do in the workshop? Oh, absolutely. What you'll be doing is actually there. Um, so we'll be doing all the individual components because it's a five day workshop, right? So we really have time to stretch it. So you'll have the option of creating your own color story, but basically, the, so this is like, this one is the double carded ombre, for example. So I have, a. Um, you're gonna go home, you're gonna do your own carding uh, obviously I'll show you how with the fiber you create created during class and then you go home and spin your own samples. So I have apply a coarse spun and a single for what is it? One, two, three, four, six different styles that you can card and how they work. So like the difference between a tweed or this one is double carding for like a Noro style ombre. This one would be a marled bat where you vertically stack the fibers. This one would be randomly painting the fibers. And then this one would be a hard stripe. So hard stripe usually has a jog. And this one would be the pre-painted ombre. So literally drilling down. And then we also have like what it looks like to single card a tweed versus double card the exact same bat and single so you can really see how colors get mulched down and color theory on the drum not just color theory for the dye fabulous thank you that's great um the other a, a question that came in early on was do you really do all of this at your house or oh yeah i live in a three level that's the top level this is the second level the main living level and the first level was a garage that's now a full-on dye studio Amazing. It's a lovely setup. Um, yeah, that's why we bought the house because there's no way to buy commercial real estate in Orange County, California. It's millions of dollars. Well, it's, it's amazing what you're able to accomplish. Um, another question came in from Amy. Uh, will there be a demonstration of wedding and dyeing combed top? Yeah. Oh, of course. We have a whole section on combed top that I am filming for the book. So it's not even prepared or ready to be shown on something like this because it's uh, we will be doing like speckle dyeing on combed top, ombre painting on combed top, random dye application on combed top, all the different ways, high water level combed top versus low water level combed top. And then you guys will be creating spun samples, just like I have spun samples for a book to show the difference. Like you're going to use the, I mean, the best you can choose whatever you want, but I always say choose the identical dyes so that you can see the difference across all the samples you're making based on how they work up. If you use different color palettes for each technique, you're going to lose the most critical part, which is a book of mounted spun swatches. So you can see all the different ways the color pools or stacks or ombres based on how you dyed it. Fabulous. Fabulous. And there is, I know the book is in process right now. Um, there's a question we have in the link, but we just added to the link, um, the webpage where you can find out more about the book. Um, but there was a question earlier about the exact title of the book. Is that have, well, I'm, I'm, 
<laughs> it's hard for me, you know, because I have recently decided that it's going to be instead of all in one book, I'm going to have to make it two: dying for spinners and dying for knitters. <laughs> The actual title, I like the idea of using hyperfixate because as someone with ADHD, that's where all of this comes from. Hyperfixation, being able to take a simple concept. 2008, the main dyer on the scene was someone who was just dipping a skein on one end yellow and one end blue, and that was it. And that's beautiful and fine and people love that, but I was like, but I want, you know, I, I needed more specificity. What I was looking for didn't exist. So I'm sorry, I forgot your question. I got so lost. It's the title of the book, but I think- Yeah, the title of the book, but again, <laughs> uh, people, I've gotten some feedback that hyperfixate is kind of a turnoff for people that don't know what it means and that it doesn't in any way relate to the yarn. But the reality is I'm, I'm very good at taking a simple concept and making it extremely complicated. <laughs> <laughs> With, and, and, and becoming an expert in the process yeah. and helping us become experts in the process, which is so- Exactly. Valuable. Well- um, for the people that have a vision, but there are thousands of dollars and tens of thousands of hours between the vision and the finished execution, why should anybody have to do that? If I've had to do it, I don't want anybody else to have to do it. I want them to be able to go straight to learning. Okay, so my dad is in research and development for Fortune 500. He does LASIK eye surgery. He makes the machines. So I learned how to do R&D in college, and I learned how to do R&D from growing up with a dad who would come home with buckets of pig eyes and proto he had a rapid prototyping machine in the late eighties, early nineties. So take like teaching you the process so that if what you see in your head can't easily be achieved by what we learn in class, you still have a process by which you can do an elimination, right. And learn how step-by-step step to record everything and actually get there. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's the teach you to fish thing, right? Yeah. It's, oh, exactly. I'm not trying to make people dependent on me forever. I mm -hmm. want them to, I, because I'm going to teach you how to do something. So one day you can do something that you're going to teach me how to do that I never would have thought of. Fabulous. I love rising that. tide raises all ships. Love that. Love that. I have another question here um, from Susan who asks, uh, do you have to be able to spin to benefit um, from the class or from you could also sample creating part, right? You could also be a felter. You could also be a needle, like any wet felting, needle felting, but there will be, um, another class that's dying for knitters. So if you're a knitter, crocheter, or weaver, and you don't spin and you don't felt that workshop is coming. And that is, it should, we're, we're looking at November and that would really be ideal for anyone that doesn't work with the raw fibers enough to justify. So the dying for spinners, the two second version is basically you learn how to do the exact same thing. You're reverse engineering. If you want semi-solid tonals, high contrast, mid contrast, low contrast, kettle dyeing, how to take three colors and create a 66 color triad or make the triad smaller or larger. And you go home with, oh, I had it in my hand. Um, I bought every color from every dye line. Well, all the major dye lines. So you have both classes, an example of what all the major dye lines colors look like before you order them. Oh, that's for you. Uh, that new, is the individual membership to the Textile Center? Promo yeah, we'll promo? add a link to it. It's an annual membership. I'll add a link to the page in a sec. Um, oh, and I forgot, this is a real hardbound book that comes with class. And it's basically what I was showing with my own swatches, right? So like this style of carding matches and this is what the yarn looks like. And this is what the knit looks like for everything. And then in the back, you know, lots and lots of color examples of bats I've done in the past, plus those die cards again. So it's sort of like your reference material. The only thing is I don't have the step. I have the step-by-step -step in the video, not in the book, just so that it was the printing cost would have been insane on that. These books are really expensive to print because they're hardbound. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, other questions? I know that there was, I think I got to all the questions. If somebody, if I missed a question, please um, add it to the chat. 
Um, we can also, I think we're amongst friends. If you want to unmute yourself, yeah. you can just talk to, you know, ask directly. Um, this is more of an informal conversation. Um, but yes, the question, Amy, that you had about membership, it is an annual membership. We have a bunch of different membership <laughs> levels too, um, for students and for day <laughs> members and individuals. So, um, you can check those out and it, it is for a year and you get discounts on all of our classes. Yeah. So we can see us. There oh, Hi. Go. Hey, Candy. Hi, Terry's Hi, iPad. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was curious about all the different uh, kinds of dye stuffs that you're going to be showing. Oh, you mean like the brand of dye? Yeah, like so wash fast acid, Lancet, what other ones? Well, there's say, Lancet is just a trade name. It's also known as Permaset from the standard colors line. Lanaset, uh, I don't remember who decided they were going to take Lanaset, but there's also Dharmaset, which I definitely <laughs> do have. That's the Dharmaset. That's the real live card. Yeah, yeah. Dharmaset. And I do have matrices for performance. There's seven lines. So Aljo, Prochem, Sabreset, Prochem, Washfast Acid, Jacquard, um, Ashford, Dharma, Dharmaset, and... Uh, greener shades okay cool i use prochem wash fast acid with a tiny bit of dharma for the stuff that prochem doesn't make prochem is the best performing on the market that i've ever found yeah and and in the dye lab too there's um a saber set or lancet uh portfolio that has all the yarns in it too so when you get there you can just it's just up on the shelf oh yeah well i also have these yeah so i have all of that mounted on a floss bobbin so that, because these are, these are fine, but let's say you're with a yarn shop owner and they want to create a colorway. They need to be able to take the tiles out and put them together because they don't have, that's a learned skill to be able to see it all in your head and not need a live swatch. So I have those just because, you know, I hyper fixation, trying to be extremely <laughs> organized, just like when we learn to do a triad. You guys can go home. You'll be mounting your own. I, we won't be doing this in class because we won't have time. But like, you know, these are like 11 different saturations of the yellow, 11 different saturations of the blue. And then the three that we picked for the triad where we make 66 colors out of three colors. I don't know yet for the, um, I'm, tr I'm experimenting with whether or not we're going to do that on roving. And then you just crochet it to the card or if we're going to do, we just should do it on yarn because that's too many extra hours and the roving falls apart or felts on these over time as you drag them in and out and put them in stuff. So, um, but yeah, it'll be on a gray, a white and a tan. So you can see, so you'll ultimately for the triad portion of this class, you'll have 66 gray, 66 tan and 66 white. Well, some of this... Okay, yeah, so that's a great question. This class is just the breakout for spinners and felters. Absolutely, basic dye math, how to do a triad, um, all of that stuff will apply to the yarn. But when we do dyeing for spinners, mm -hmm. we're doing, or dyeing for knitters, there it's definitely worthwhile if you do both to take both classes because we're not doing resist dyeing on fiber. We're not doing direct application for forced pooling on raw fiber. We're not doing, I mean, we'll do speckling, but the way speckling works up on raw fiber when you spin it is just a barber pole. We're not gonna be looking at speckle margin and diameter and how certain colors back bleed like we do in the dyeing for knitters class. So if you're primarily interested in dyeing pre-spun pre milled yarn, then that the one in November would be the one to mark for your calendar because that is such a highly technical class based on like resist dyeing for solid black background with tiny stitches of pink or yellow or whatever. And we literally create an entire lib library of color swatches like this on yarn for yarn. So yeah, there's overlap for sure in that Venn diagram of those two things but you're still going to be doing a ton of work if you take the dyeing for spinners class um, and you really want to know how to translate it to yarn techniques just because once you spin this fiber you're distorting it out like that so the techniques don't match and there's stuff we do on yarn we would never do on fiber and so that just 
keep an eye. We'll be posting those dates soon. The, the link that's in the chat now is for the class that's coming up at the end of April. So if you're interested in making, in dyeing fibers in the beautiful ways that Nicole has been showing us, then that's the one to sign up for. Um, and there was another question that came in. Uh, Clara would like to know what, um, what uses uh, Nicole recommends for hand spun multicolored yarns. Not Got it. To, okay. Yeah. So everybody, you know, something I love forced pooling. There are so many people that go out of their way to avoid it. So um, this is like the way you spin a bat. I've seen people take a bat of mine that was meant to have a slow ombre. And instead of stripping it sideways to preserve that, they've gone across the top back and forth because they were making a sock. And if they did the long, slow ombre, they'd have two completely different socks. One would be half of one ombre and one would be the other. So spinning back and forth across the bat laid flat, gave them those smaller stripes for a sock. So what would you do with these multicolored yarns? I personally think that using, having a solid shade background on a sweater, like a Lopa Pisa, Icelandic, and then using your high contrast multicolored yarn as the yoke in a Fair Isle motif, because no matter how crazy complicated that looks in stockinette or garter as a square, it doesn't necessarily always work up that good. Like this is an example, this particular carding style is marl. So you put the pink, then the orange, then the yellow, then the green. So every single stitch is likely to have all of the colors, which looks great in the bat. And it looks great in the yarn. I would, me personally, I don't like this. But because look. look, this is it on a bulky. And this is it on a two ply. It just looks garbled and messy. But someone's going to look at that and go, that's the height. That's the, This is clown barf to me. So what we're trying to do <laughs> is not necessarily answer the question of the ultimate beauty standard of the final form and what is better, an ombre or a marl or a hard stripe or a soft stripe, but just to give you the raw information so you can see what you're attracted to the most, what you're trying to avoid. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, another question from Amy was, what brand induction burner do you use? I use Duxtop. I've been using, I, I don't cheap out on burners because I have taught at places where they had like Ikea burners and they were really inconsistent in terms of getting too hot or not hot enough. And I just, uh, that particular one, the duck's top double burner was $200, but it goes up to 460 degrees, which I do not need. Nobody needs to go 212 is boiling, right? 212 is boiling. At no point do we want to boil anything we want to be just under boiling um for for we don't even need we we can some of those colors those paler yellows and oranges require like 178 degrees they don't even need but if you're doing four percent jet black that's a really high percentage of a tricky color then i have found that if you don't get the heat to one or two degrees below boiling you will not get all the dye absorbed which means it'll come off on your hands while you're knitting it that's good to know. Any other questions for Nicole? Or comments, or even if or you're comments, like, hey, yes. I wish you had, are you ever going to do this element? Or I haven't heard you go, you know, I don't get better at my class. I always have classes when I teach. We always have um, at the end, a sit down where I ask for criticism, feedback, what could have made it better, what really worked for you, what you were confused by. The reason I made these die cards and started making them, not the one, my own for Dharma my, and all of that was because students at the end of class said the, the jar said sour apple green and this looks nothing like a sour apple and I didn't like it. How do we know what these colors look like because before we put it on yarn? And so I was like, wow, I have a five-year project of buying all the dye and then, you know, measuring it out and then creating these little like laminated handouts and crocheting it on. But it was a great, it was a great point. Same with, I I used to explain what the difference would look like. And I realized not everybody has the ability to see a picture in their head. So um, creating actual pictures of swatches was just necessary for the class to be maximum beneficial for all students, 
not just the ones who came to the table with certain skill sets that made them better. I had someone who was a lawyer who could not see color combinations in her head and didn't know if she would like it until she saw it. She could not in any way create an idea in her head that she could work from. So that was why I created literally like 30 extra reference materials just for dyeing for knitters, because I had no idea there were people that can't see pictures in their head. Now I do. I read, read up about it. It's not prosopagnosia, but it's like a, about like 5% of the population can't um, visualize a teacup on demand. They don't see it. So right now, um, I'll just say in response to um, Susan's question, the class that has open registration right now is the Dying for Spinners and Felters class. That's the DNA of Dying. And let's see if I can put it back in the chat for everybody here. Um, so that's the one to sign up for. That will allow you to do everything that Nicole just showed in the videos and that we've been talking about. So um, if you're interested in taking a deep dive with Nicole on some of these processes and getting some of those gorgeous colors, and that's definitely the class to sign up for. Um, yeah. I would say if you, I mean, a lot of knitters have the idea that one day they want to spin. And there isn't a class like this on the market. That's the reason why I built it. I basically built this class for Nicole from 16 years ago <laughs> uh, to like, I built this class. If you want to start a business based in fiber, this is the class. If you want to have more control, I mean, we've all bought bats that were sticky and felted and didn't spin beautifully and dirt fell out on our lap while we spun it. We've all bought robing from someone that the colors were stunning. The yarn was stunning. We went to set our project and just bled, turned brown. All of us have had that experience of our hands turning colors. This is the reason, these are the types of things that made me become more and more self-sufficient because I couldn't stand spending my precious coins on something that ultimately did not perform. And um, also I, I just, there's no reason that people should be toiling away in their kitchens or in their garages um, and putting the work in and spending the money on the supplies. And it just sucks. The first batch sucks. The third batch sucks. The 27th batch is meh. That's so discouraging that I think there's a large percentage of the population that just gives up because they don't have a mentor. Like I'm available long after the class. There's a private dye, frost yarn dye masterclass group on Facebook that I moderate that, that you can query me directly. I'm releasing formulas. I'm showing new stuff all the time. It's also got all of my free tutorials by technique at the top of the class. So if you just want to look at speckles all day and not have to pay a dime, you can. Yeah. Having, this would probably be, uh, Susan, definitely like if you have interest in spinning one day, this is going to jumpstart that. And it's not like if you take the spinning class and the knitting class, you're going to go, I just paid twice for the same thing. The only thing that's overlapping that we talk about out of both are going to be five day workshops is the chemistry behind getting the dye to adhere to the yarn. But when you take dyeing for knitters, you're going to go home with an entire color swatch book that you create yourself and technique book that you create yourself. Same with the spinning. And no, they're the, the way that we approach dyeing for spinners is very different than the way we approach dyeing for knitters because the, the mechanics of how you stack and lay color and those swatches that you're going to make for spinning do not translate to what we do for knitting. And the people who've taken both workshops, the one day version that I take, I've never had one person say they feel like they could have gotten all of that in one. Not one person has ever said, oh, I should have only taken this one and I would have been able to figure it out. It's very much two different skill sets. I, I just wanted to, two things to point out. One is that I know you're not a felter, Nicole, but this is definitely to my mind, I love wet felting. And this to my mind is such a yummy class for anyone. Who yeah. Felt. Oh, for because sure. And can we can also create the incredible colors of roving that you may be yeah. get online. And it's so much less expensive to do it yourself. Like you can get the roving from RH Lindsay, high quality roving from between nine and $16. And the dye is a couple pennies and the acid is a couple pennies. And if you're willing, if you get a, an, an induction burner with jars, especially if you're doing small felting, right? If you're doing huge, huge projects, yeah, you're looking at a day or two of dyeing and then laying it out to dry. But becoming self-sufficient isn't just 
it costs me less because I do it. It's you have ultimate control over the color yes. and no, no wet felter, which I can definitely wet and needle felt. It's not my primary, but I have done it. Oh, I wouldn't teach a felting class, but I, I can felt. And the reason I can felt is because I wanted to be able to sell, um, have this class be relevant to felters as well. So we do things, we learn things like how to dye bamboo and cellulose fibers in this class, but they are not ideal for felters. And the reason they're not ideal is because the pH range for cellulose fibers or anything that comes from a plant, right? Cotton, bamboo, whatever, um, is very different from the pH that sets wool, acid, protein fibers. So usually you will force a bleed if you try to use any kind of bamboo or cotton in your wet felting with hot soapy water and all these acid dyed fibers underneath. So it's like, okay, you can wet felt it and then go over the top with a needle felting barb, or you can put a netting over the top and do it kind of cold product, like different ways that you can get the fiber in without the worst case scenario, because cotton is a bleeder. Wool doesn't bleed if you use the correct dye at the correct acid and the correct saturation point and temperature. Um, cotton's going to bleed forever at some level. And it, the breaking the bond of the dye is very easy. Cotton doesn't want the dye. We all had that red shirt we bought that stained our clothes and it had been washed 30 times and it still stains clothes. The molecule size of the uh, dye and the receptor site to which it binds is not the same size, which is why it's unstable. That's interesting. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to mention too, is that for anyone who's interested in this class, but maybe doesn't have a lot of experience with spinning, we do have some drop spindles here at Textile Center, which we will have in the space for anyone who wants to try their hand. And I know that Chloe Russell Chang, who's my colleague here in education is a fabulous spinner and will be taking this class as well. So perhaps Chloe can give you some yeah, pointers that would be for, amazing. for any of you who want to do some spinning too. Yeah. And for anyone who's coming in from out of town or like my hope is that we can all get connected the two weeks before class or the week before class, because every night I don't want to go to home to an empty hotel room and scroll on my phone forever. I was kind of hoping to have, you know, when we were kids, like sleepover style, we hang out, we spin, we have food, we hang out, whoever's got the largest accommodation and we just talk shop. We continue the fun. Some people are going to be introverted and burnt out from the knowledge dump of the day and don't want that. But for the high octane extroverts like myself, and the thing is, I feel like, you know, you're investing in me and my ability to continue doing this as a way to support my family. And you're investing in the textile center, being able to continue to offer this. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm going to want to give you as much of my time as possible and allow you to pick my brain. I am not proprietary. Nobody signs an NDA when they take my class. There is no expectation of secrecy. I've always had an open platform. Those who can't afford it can find the information for free if they're willing to do a deep dive and watch a lot of stuff and compile on their own. But for those who can afford it, they get a, the the experience of all of their questions answered in person learning hands on and going away with you know books like this and things like this right and this and these and i don't think that um i i grew up very very poor we lived in cars and hooker hotels so i come from a poverty mentality and i hate the idea of anybody being as poor as i was when i came to yarn but all the excitement in the world but being stymied in their development as a fiber artist by the fact that they couldn't afford access to the information. So I'm never going to put a paywall behind access to that information. And that's why if you go on my YouTube, my Facebook, my Instagram, and you go under frost yarn dye tutorial as a hashtag, you'll just see years and years of stuff. Amazing. And it is an amazing resource that everyone should check out. Similarly, I, you know, fully support what Nicole was saying about barriers to access and making sure that there aren't barriers to access for people who want to take a class. Um, we also have scholarships available at Textile Center for all of our workshops, including this one. So um, oh, please. Sorry to interrupt you, ADHD yeah, yeah, squirrel. We also talked beforehand for there are like uh, people that are coming from out of town. If you'd like to cost share your accommodation, meaning go in on an Airbnb instead of everybody individually getting expensive hotel rooms. There are people who are coming in from out of town that are happy to book 
an Airbnb together so that you can have a kitchen and you can be with your fellow classmates and cut, you know, cut that budget down to 50 bucks a night instead of 150 bucks a night for those five days. And I would be happy to share that accommodation as well. I don't need my own hotel room. So put me up with the students. That would be so fun. It'd be like a sleepover every night. It's it's the spinning sleepover ready to happen. (laughs) Oh yeah. It's the ultimate best friend uh, sleepover with strangers that become like, like, I'm so excited. I love that because I've done that so many times. I usually stay with students when I come out. It's so fun. And you just talk all night and spin and knit. And it's like the best because we have this thing that binds us all, no matter what demographic background we come from, we have a pathological addiction, dopamine pathway, good feeling around creating. We're all artists. And so getting, I love that light bulb moment. I love seeing somebody catch that infection from me or their fellow classmates about an idea. That is what I live for. The money is secondary and I wish it wasn't even involved because I would do this for free. I would, if I could afford to, this is so fun. And the community that it creates is an experience that no one should miss. Thank you so much, Nicole. Yeah. We're so excited to have you here um, and for the spinning sleepover and all that will happen in the Dye Lab. And I hope that many of you will be able to join us. Um, and I'll send some follow-up with more links, including to your um, to your pages, Nicole, to your website and to your Instagram, so that any, anybody who wants to follow you who isn't already. Um, but just thank you for your time. Thank you all for joining. And um, we will see you in April. Woohoo! I love you guys. Bye.